So look, dude, whatever your favorite game may be, you know, single or multiplayer, linear or open world, regardless, there's always one thing that every gamer out there loves to hear, and that's simply that more content is on its way. I mean, from something as simple as developers adding in a few new characters to the game, like with Dead by Daylight or Super Smash Bros, to just massive and out-of-this-world expansions, like with the recent Shadow of the Erd Tree from Elden Ring, or even just some small little extra story stuff that can provide some more context to the main game and something like The Last of Us Left Behind. Look, man, the point is, is that DLC can come in so many different forms and in so many different shapes and sizes. And so of course, over the years, we've seen some downright amazing expansions to our favorite games. But the thing is, is that oftentimes many of them are just that, expansions, just more of the same. But very rarely, and every now and then, you can get a piece of DLC that can be so freaking amazing that more than just expanding, it can actually improve, save, or even eclipse the original game it came from. So of course, I gotta ask, you know, what actually makes a great DLC? And moreover, what are the best DLCs ever to be created? Well, today, my friends, let's try and figure that all out together as we walk through my top 10 list of the best DLCs of all time. So real quick here, before we dive into the list, I got a couple of things I want to toss out there and make known, just so you know what you're getting into with this video. And so first off, and just for some context around the criteria I'm using to rank all these DLCs, it should be said I'm using nothing besides my own personal opinion. You know, I'm not going through and ranking everything based off of how many copies were sold or how much money was made, and I'm not basing it off of simply just how much content was added. Look, every single entry on this list has their very own particular reason for showing up, but more than anything else, I'm just basing it off of the DLCs that have stuck with me the longest and I personally love the most. But as well, one last little thing before we get the list rolling, and as obvious as this may sound, I think it should still be stated that I have not played every video game known to man. Look, I'll admit it, there are plenty of holes in my knowledge when it comes to video game DLC, especially when we start venturing off into that fantasy genre. So before anyone starts flipping out because I don't talk about The Witcher 3's Blood and Wine or Oblivion Shivering Isles, please understand that's not me trying to say those games with their DLC suck. More than anything, it's just that, you know, as blasphemous as this may sound to some gamers, those just aren't my types of games. And so even if they were on the list, I don't think I'd give them a fair shake anyway, so I'm not gonna talk about them. And just one more tiny thing before we really get into the video. I'm sorry, I know I'm getting annoying at this point. But my quick little editor's note is that we're gonna be talking over a bunch of different games. Some of them old and some of them new. And so for some of them, I will be spoiling stuff here and there, but if it's anything new, I will give you a massive spoiler warning beforehand. But if it's anything older than a decade, you've had plenty of time to play those games, so I'm gonna let the spoilers fly on those. But that's all I had to say, I just wanted to make sure I threw that out there just for full context, but anyways, back to the rest of the video, man. But anyways, before I start giving more about the list away, I suppose we should just dive right in. And so for number 10, for our very first entry, we got a little bit of a weird one to talk about. And that's simply because when I say DLC, I'm sure the first thing that comes to mind is new story or mission content, but remember, like I was saying in the intro, DLC can come in so many different shapes and sizes. So for our first slot, and as a bit of an honorable mention, we gotta talk about a franchise that has excelled in delivering its DLC in a completely different manner. Of course, at number 10, it's time to talk about the combat packs from Mortal Kombat. So with this franchise, especially over the last few titles, I'd like to think they had a pretty solid and stacked base roster of characters. But of course, like any good Mortal Kombat fan, anytime a new game is coming around the corner, one of the first things people start speculating on is who's going to be in that DLC lineup? Who's going to show up in the combat packs? And that excitement, that speculation, it mainly stems from two very important things. First, and on the most basic level, there is a bit of a novelty factor to it all. I mean, who wouldn't want to see their favorite icon? iconic movie monster or legendary video game character show up in their favorite fighting game. For example, you know, like with Mortal Kombat 1 so far, we've gotten characters like Homelander, Peacemaker, and Omni-Man. But further back, like with Mortal Kombat 11, we got Robocop, Rambo, Spawn, or Terminator, which in my eyes, every single one of these characters were downright amazing. They were all nearly perfect additions to the game, but the best of all, the best DLC characters I believe this franchise has ever seen, of course, was with Mortal Kombat 10. I mean, dude, come on now, to have a damn Xenomorph in Mortal Kombat, The Predator, Leatherface, or Jason fucking Voorhees? All I can say is, for me as a fan of those old school horror movies and being a wee 14 to 15 year old lad when the game and the DLC dropped, it was all just, in a simple way of saying it, mind blowing to me at the time. And so now, aside from me just listing off a bunch of different cool characters, like I was saying a second ago though, there are two important aspects behind what makes the combat pack so awesome. So secondly, and the thing that's a bit more under the hood and arguably a bit more important when it comes to the combat packs, is the way that these characters were 
implemented into their games. I mean, think about this for a second, man. DLC characters is nothing new for a lot of different games out there. For example, you can play as Anakin Skywalker, Kratos, and Isaac Clarke all in Fortnite. Or instead, you can play as Frank the Bunny, Ghostface, or Judge Dredd all in Call of Duty. So then why are we talking about Mortal Kombat when other games obviously have more and arguably even cooler DLC characters tacked on? Well, it's because the way the Netherrealm added and crafted these characters was true to their source material in a way that directly translates over not only into their appearance, but most importantly, into their gameplay. The way the developers made the movesets, the special moves, and of course, the fatalities, it's all done in a way where it kind of makes you as the player feel like those iconic characters when you play as them, as opposed to just feeling like a skin slapped over a basic character model. I mean, like from Jason being able to stand back up after dying, or Peacemaker, who throughout a match is constantly talking to and commanding his phallic-shaped helmet, just like in the show. Or best of all, the damn Terminator, who literally has an ability to make himself near invincible and just be able to walk straight forward without ever being staggered. Look, man, there are a thousand examples I could give you, but the point really is, what makes the DLC characters so cool is not just simply because they were already legendary or iconic characters. I mean, of course, it does play a role a little bit. But truly, what makes these combat packs so next level special, especially when compared to other games that do a similar sort of thing, is because of how Netherrealm, time after time, game after game, has gone that extra mile to turn the inclusion of these characters into a bit of a celebration behind what made them so iconic to begin with. And not simply through their skins or intros, but instead directly through their moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. And of course, there's other games out there that do a similar sort of thing. I brought some up in the intro, like with Dead by Daylight. But at least to me personally, I've just never seen another franchise do DLC cameo characters better than Mortal Kombat, and that's why it earned its spot at the number 10 slot on our list. But look, man, with all that being said, and with the combat packs now under our belt, I think it's time we push it into the next spot on the list. And for this one, it's one I kind of gave away in the intro a little bit. Of course, at number 9, I'm talking about The Last of Us Left Behind. And now, just right from the top, I want to say that I think this DLC is so incredibly special for a lot of different reasons. But just on the most basic of levels, this is one of the few instances where the story they told here was so freaking amazing that it could have been a standalone game or movie and I would have loved it just as much as is. But the thing is, because it wasn't, and because it was a part of that already awesome Last of Us universe, this is one of the rare times where it didn't only expand on its story, but it instead went that extra mile to make that original narrative just so much better. I mean, the basic premise for Left Behind is it's a bit of a prequel for the main game and that it explains a bit more about Ellie and the events that led to her finding out she was immune. So essentially, the story here is that Ellie, with her best friend slash girlfriend named Riley, sneak out to go to a mall. And when they get there, they're able to restore power and kind of have the luxury to just screw around a little bit and see how life used to be before the outbreak. You know, they're playing in arcades, dancing with each other. It's almost like their first date in a lot of ways. But of course, being a part of the Last of Us universe, you know the drill. Nothing can stay pure and happy forever. And so eventually, everything just goes off the rails. Clickers come sprinting in and both of the characters, Ellie and Riley, end up bit. And at that point, they're forced to sit there and make the awful, heart-aching decision to either just end it all together or instead cut their losses, stay there, and lose their minds together. And man, when you have to sit there and watch these literal kids go through this and make such grown-up decisions even though they shouldn't have to, it's just one of those things where, look, I'm not gonna lie, it had me tearing up when I played it. It absolutely broke my heart. And of course, just on top of that, to know how this is gonna end, to know that unlike Riley, Ellie got the blessing or the curse to wake up just fine. And so she had to sit there and deal with not only losing her best friend, but to instead have to be the one to actually end Riley's zombified existence. All of it together, it just adds so much more weight to the story arc of Ellie, but as well, just to the entirety of the base game story as well. Like, for example, when Joel and Ellie have that conversation in the ranch house in the main game, if you know what goes down in Left Behind, it makes that scene, those words she says, hit so much harder. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel but I have lost people too. You have no idea what loss is. Everyone I have cared for has either died or left me. Everyone fucking except for you. So don't tell me that I would be safer with someone else because the truth is I would just be more scared. All of it just adds such a harder punch in the gut for the story because this chick, Ellie, has gone through the unimaginable. And it becomes so much more clear that all she wants is someone who cares and loves for her and most importantly, isn't gonna fade into nothingness the moment she gets close to them. And now it's not only because she says so, it's because we've truly seen and personally experienced what she's been through. Look, the point is, and the reason this DLC found its way on the list is because of the story expansion, it made an already perfect game even better. And you know, we get new DLC story content 
content for single player games all the time. That's not really anything new. But just never have I ever had a story expansion shift the way I think about a character the way that Left Behind did. It is truly a feat of storytelling. And honestly, this is just one of the most beautiful and tragic stories I've ever seen in video games altogether. But hey, with the storyline of that Left Behind DLC put away, I think it's time we push it into the next spot on the list. And for our next one, it's time to bring it out of this little bit of a sad and depressing lull and bring it into some over the top and crazy 80s synthwave action. Of course, at the number 8 spot, it is time to talk about Far Cry 3's Blood Dragon. And listen, coming off of Left Behind, a DLC with a story that could rival some of the best in modern cinema, I'm sure that Blood Dragon might seem like a bit of a shocking pick. But honestly, the thing I love about this DLC and why it's earned this spot on the list is because Far Cry Blood Dragon is a lot more to me than just the content it has to offer. You know, more than anything, it's a symbol that embodies something so special about video games that has slowly been lost over the years. And that's just game companies and developers having the balls to throw any caution out the window, and having the ability to just say fuck it, let's make something funky, badass, and fun simply because we think the players will like it. You know, no focus on earning metrics, no way analyzing what content would sell the most copies, instead it was purely just making something for the fun of it. I mean, hailing from Far Cry 3, Blood Dragon in almost every way besides its gameplay mechanics has nothing to do with that original experience. For example, it's set in a hyper-futuristic 2007 where the world has been ravaged by nuclear warfare, and you, as Commander Rex Power Colt, have to take on waves and outposts of these cyber ninja looking guys, with 80s movie references and horribly hilarious one-liners strewn about all along the way. And listen, is this simple? Is it a little bit smaller than I'd like to admit, and does it fail to add in anything meaningful to the Far Cry storyline? Well, obviously, the answer is yes to every single one of those questions, but at the end of the day, what Blood Dragon really is is over-the-top action and fun as hell gameplay. And just like I was saying a second ago, more than anything, this DLC is an embodiment of what made that 2010s era of gaming so freaking special. You know, companies weren't scared to go out on a limb and make something that could totally flop, all for the sake of just trying to make something new and cool for their players. And we need more of that today, because even still, even in 2024, there is nothing else out there quite like Blood Dragon, and that's why it earned its place at the number 8 spot on our list. But anyways, man, that's three DLCs down, and we still got quite a few more to go, so bringing us in here to the next one, we gotta talk about one from one of the best video game franchises in all of history. At number 7, it's time to talk about the Bioshock games, and the DLC in particular, although it was a really hard choice to make, has gotta be Burial at Sea from Bioshock Infinite. And look, I say it was a hard choice to make because Minerva's Den from Bioshock 2 is really up there for me as well, that one is amazing. But the thing about Burial at Sea that just pushes it over the edge of being a little bit better comes down to two main factors. First, and I'll admit it, there is obviously a hefty amount of nostalgia associated with getting to go back to Rapture. But secondly, and more importantly, instead of this just being crammed full of nostalgia bait and member berries to sell copies, the developers here instead use this iconic setting in a way that creates one of the coolest connecting through lines between an entire franchise of games that I think I've ever seen as a gamer. I mean, look, when Bioshock 1 and 2 came out with the city of Rapture, the big daddies, the creepy little sisters, the plasmids, or the splicers, it was all so damn unique and it became instantly iconic. And so in Burial at Sea, when you finally go back to Rapture after all of these years, but for it to be so different, for this DLC to show a complete other side of the city where Rapture is like kind of in its prime, like everything actually functioning with people going throughout their day in this hustling and bustling city deep beneath the ocean waves, you know, it was just a side of this universe I was never expecting to see, but then just on top of that, to kind of be able to watch the city fall, to be able to watch it progress into mayhem, all the way up to the point where finally, at the end of the second episode for the DLC, they tie it all in and set up the events for the original Bioshock with the plane sinking into the ocean and all, it was just one of those moments where, as a guy who played the original two games as a real little kid and then at the time of Burial at Sea's release, playing it as a teenager, I hate saying this because it sounds so corny, but it was one of those like surreal and magical video game moments where I couldn't help but just smile at the screen the entire time. And listen, with this DLC, it's sort of like what I was saying with The Last of Us Left Behind. It took the existing story, or in this case the franchise, and just made it even better. It retroactively made me love Bioshock 1 and 2 even more because it added to it all in a way where it deepened the lore and it showed us a new side of this universe, but then it even went the extra mile to be so much more than just simple nostalgia by finding one of the coolest and most ingenious ways to tie everything together. And because of that, with this expansion, with Burial at Sea, it's one of the few times in all of gaming where the expansion alone surpassed the game it originates from in my mind. And dude, don't get me wrong, I love Bioshock Infinite for sure, it is a genuinely amazing game. But nonetheless, anytime Infinite or the Bioshock series in general comes up in the conversation, the first thing I always think about is Burial at Sea. And so obviously, that's why it earned its place at the number 7 spot on the list. And dude, I'm praying, we need another Bioshock game, I would do just about anything at this point. But anyways man, with the Bioshock stuff aside and moving it 
forward in the list, maybe you noticed this, but so far we've really only been touching on a lot older expansions. And in some sense, you know, rightfully so. I mean, the longer they've been out, the easier it is to really think about them and pick apart what made those DLCs so great. But regardless, for this next one, we gotta talk about an expansion that came out actually pretty recently. And weirdly, it was a piece of DLC that no one was really asking for. No one really even knew it was coming, but nonetheless, I am so freaking happy we got to play it. So of course, at number six on the list, it is time to talk about God of War Ragnarok's Valhalla DLC. And so for this little expansion, at least as I see it, there are three very crucial aspects behind what makes this DLC so freaking awesome. So starting out here, just first off, Santa Monica Studios pulled one of the most classy moves I've ever seen a game company do in my entire life. And that's that they made the DLC completely free, and then they dropped it mere days after announcing it, basically handing it out like a Christmas gift for all their fans, considering it dropped in mid-December. But secondly, and more actually talking about the game itself, it took that already outstanding God of War gameplay loop and combat, and then tossed it into a little roguelike spin on the franchise. And the really cool thing about it was you really got to screw around and experiment with all the different abilities and weapons in a way you weren't really able to in the base game, and because of that, it just elevated the already near-perfect combat to an even higher plane of existence. But as well, and for the third and final reason for this DLC being on the list, and as you're gonna see, this is starting to become a trend at this point, but it's because of how they further expanded that already amazing story of Kratos while simultaneously finding a bit of a through line to take those older games in the franchise and bring them all the way up to today into the newly explored world of the Norse gods. And I mean, I'm gonna spoil it here, so if you don't want to hear anything about it, that's totally okay, you can skip this part, just click to the timestamp above real quick. But anyways, to finally be able to go back to this weird and mind-altered version of Greece and being able to deal with the prick Helios again, and of course to be able to bust out the fucking Blade of Olympus as a special ability, dude, it was like one of the coolest things ever. But more importantly, you know, nostalgia and cool factor aside, to finally see Kratos really come to terms with his demons, to see him literally face to face with his younger self, it was just such a full circle moment where it truly exemplified how far Kratos has come not only as a man, but as a father and a leader. And then to end it all off with him taking on the mantle once again of that fearsome god of war, but this time for him to have a spin on it where it's not really god of war, instead it's the god of hope. And then when you take that all in context with what happened in the OG trilogy with Pandora's box and Kratos dying, just... Oh my god, I don't know if I'm being stupid, but it was just some of the best storytelling I've ever seen. But again, I want to emphasize something. I mean, this DLC is on the list because of its amazing storytelling, but at the very same time, we've already talked about a couple other DLCs that have some amazing storytelling as well, so what makes this one so much better? Well, simply put, it's the context around how this expansion released. I mean, to give anything away to your fans for free, and especially for it to be as big and push the story as much as Valhalla does, that is something just so incredibly rare I have never seen in my entire life, and I don't know if we'll ever see another game company do something like that. I mean, just as a bit of a comparison, right around this exact same time, we got that Last of Us Part 2 roguelike side mode called No Return. But for this one, it came alongside a remaster and a $10 little upgrade. And listen, 10 bucks is not a big deal. It is super reasonable. But yet, for God of War Valhalla to be given out as a gift to their players right before Christmas, and for it to bring us back to Greece, for it to put the damn Blade of Olympus in your hands, for it to close with Kratos truly becoming the God of War yet again, it was just such an amazing piece of DLC, and I'd say it even rivaled some of the best actual full-scale games in all of 2023. But hey man, at this point we're halfway through the list, we got five more to go, and for this next spot we gotta talk about, this DLC is really special in that more than any of the other ones I'll talk about, hell, more than any other DLC in all of existence, I have played this more than anything else. So of course, at the number five spot, it is time to talk about Zombie Chronicles from Black Ops 3. And now listen, I was a little conflicted about putting this one on the list, because you know, this is an expansion that doesn't really add anything new, it's more like a compilation, like a best hits album or something like that. And yeah, man, if that's how you want to look at it, you would not be wrong. That is 100% the case. But the more I started to think about it, the more my mind started to realize that just simply saying this is a compilation, while being true, is just massively reductive. Because Zombie Chronicles, more than anything else, was really just a culmination of almost everything us zombie fans grew up loving and the crew at Treyarch had so beautifully crafted over the years. I mean, you know, to be able to go back to all these classic maps from Ascension to Noct, Verrucked, Kino, Moon, or Shangri-La, and all with wildly better graphics and arguably some better gameplay mechanics in some ways, all of it together, it just turned this DLC into becoming the definitive edition of Call of Duty Zombies. Look, overall, man, it is a really simple expansion. It just brought in a ton of already existing content and put it in a more accessible and graphically pleasing form. But at least for me, I don't really think everything constantly needs to be wildly new or unique. And like I said in the intro, again, DLC can come in so many different forms. And so sometimes the best thing an expansion could really be is just a better version of something that's already out there. And that's exactly what this is, because Zombies 
Zombie Chronicles is the absolute pinnacle of what Call of Duty Zombies has to offer. And just a real quick wee bit of a plug here for a second, you know, if you want to hear my full take on Call of Duty Zombies, I made a full length like 30 minute video breaking down everything, all the games, the origins and everything. So if that sounds interesting to you and that's something you'd want to watch, you know, make sure you check that out after this video. I put a ton of effort into that one. It'd be cool if you watched it. But anyways, man, with Zombie Chronicles now put to rest, we only have a few more games that we got to tackle. And for this next slot, we got to talk about a DLC that hails from a game that I truly do believe is the best puzzle and sci-fi game ever to be created. Of course, at the number four spot, I am talking about The Outer Wilds and its DLC called The Echoes of the Eye. And so just right off the rip, before I say anything else, dude, if you have not played The Outer Wilds, don't watch anything online. Don't watch a YouTuber play it. Don't watch a streamer. Don't watch a review. Just for the love of God, do yourself the favor, download the game and give it a whirl. I promise you, you are going to be so extremely happy you did. I mean, look, I know my opinion is just that, an opinion. In some ways, it's meaningless, but I am not exaggerating when I say The Outer Wilds is in my top three games of all time. It is legitimately a gaming masterpiece on every single level. I cannot recommend it to you enough. But now for this expansion, for Echoes of the Eye in particular, what I truly believe makes this stand out is an amazing piece of DLC is with something I've already said quite a few times with the other titles on the list, and that's with the way that everything is interwoven into the original game. But the cool thing here, there's a bit of a twist on it this time, because it's not so much with the story or plot. No, instead, this DLC was woven into the fabric of the universe and galaxy in a way that made it seem like it was always there to begin with. So look, essentially, without giving too much about the story away at all, the way the DLC starts is with some new clues that hint at a certain ancient space station that's been floating around the sun. And more importantly, it is only visible if you can catch it eclipsing the central star, otherwise it's impossible to see, being engulfed by the black void of space around it. So like I was saying, it's as if this vessel has always been here, just wandering the galaxy the same way you were the entire time you played the main game, but you just missed it. You just had to find the new clues to help unravel this mystery to find the new space station. And listen, I'm doing everything I can to keep this as extremely vague as possible, because I really do want you to play this game, and like 98% of the magic of this experience is figuring everything out for yourself. So in the most spoiler-free way I can say it, as you progress into the space station and as you get deeper and deeper into the story and start to unravel what was going on in this galaxy centuries ago, and as you start to learn about these owl people and what they were doing here and what brought them here in the first place, but as well with what happened to them and where the hell they went, it's really just such a mind-blowing and sort of depressing tale that goes in a ton of different directions I was never expecting it to. And at least for me, I can say that it's a story and experience that rivals some of the best sci-fi in all of media just across the board. And now on the other side of that, I will say the only downside downside of this DLC is unlike the original story where you're planet hopping constantly and finding a clue deep within Dark Bramble to then pop over to a Giant's Deep and discover something brand new over there, you know there really isn't a whole lot of that stuff in this DLC. Again, it's really more of a boxed in sort of journey. But regardless, with the locations, puzzles, and mysteries they do have here, and with the way they bring in a few new mechanics like some spooky gameplay or some new brain bending puzzles, and of course how all of it seamlessly ties in with this galaxy's overarching story, all I can say is it's just about perfect, man. Truly, this DLC is just everything I adored about the original game, but it's just more of it. But here's the thing, man, that's why it's not higher on the list, because I'll admit it, I know a lot of my love for this expansion simply stems from me holding that original game in such a massively high regard. I mean, not to say that this DLC isn't amazing, I mean, it's fucking awesome, but it's just that in the grand scheme of all video game DLC history, I think there's a few more out there that did something a little more substantial and a little more groundbreaking than Echoes of the Eye. Like, for example, and just pressing on with our list, we gotta talk about an expansion that brought one of the most clowned on games from the depths of of hell and has now arguably made it one of my favorite open world games that I've ever had the pleasure of playing through. So now at the number three spot, it is time to talk about Cyberpunk 2077's Phantom Liberty expansion. And listen man, for this entry, I am kind of cheating. I'm bending the rules a tad bit here because I'm talking about that Cyberpunk 2.0 update alongside the Phantom Liberty expansion. Because you know, they came out right around the same time. They kind of came out in tandem. At least for me, I thought that was the sell. And just for clarity, just for full transparency, if I wasn't talking about the 2.0 update, Phantom Liberty would probably fall like five, six, or seven. But look, man, I'm pretty sure you get what I'm saying, so regardless of all of that, we all remember how that initial cyberpunk launch went, right? I mean, the game was downright horrific. It was a glitch-infested nightmare that was borderline unplayable at times. And it was so bad, in fact, that it actually got pulled from the PlayStation Store, which is something almost unheard of. And so now, the thing about this Phantom Liberty expansion and that 2.0 update that make it so special is, like I was already saying, it took that broken and pathetic mess of a game and turned it into one of the most unique experiences I've ever played through. And now, obviously, a lot of that 
that was done through that 2.0 update on its own, with new mechanics for cars, combat, cyberware, and so much more. But honestly, and I'm not sure if I'm alone in feeling this way, but after playing the game all the way through again recently, Phantom Liberty included, I honestly think the expansion of the story here was the highest point of the entire game. I mean, I can't really put my finger on exactly what it is about the base game story, but parts of it even still just feel a little stilted to me, especially in the beginning, the game just kind of drags along at a snail's pace. But with the Phantom Liberty storyline, every step of the way, I was hooked. I mean, from the first time you step into Dogtown, the new map location, it's all just oozing with an aesthetic very similar, but far and away better than any other location in the game in my mind. You know, it's like a dingy Blade Runner-esque criminal infested Las Vegas, pyramid and all. And I mean, listen, the reason this DLC is so high on the list is because, at least to me, this is one of the rare instances where I thought a game's DLC didn't only outshine the original package, but it instead brought it back from Flatline. It saved it and has now polished it up to the point where it's one of the best open world experiences of the early 2020s. And that right there is why it earned its place as the number three spot on the list. But hey man, we're really getting up there at this point. We only got two more expansions we gotta cover. And for this next installment of DLC, I know this is one you're expecting to see. I mean, hell, it was the entire reason I sat down and started writing the video out to begin with. So with the grand number two spot, it is time to talk about Shadow of the Erd Tree from Elden Ring. And so for this one, although it is at the number two spot, I'm gonna try and keep everything pretty short and sweet, because more than any other DLC we've talked about so far, this thing is brand spanking new. But as well, and just on top of that, knowing how seriously people take their FromSoft games, I don't want to be the guy to spoil anything for you, but here's the deal, man. The thing with Shadow of the Erd Tree is it does just about everything I've been praising all these other DLCs for. You know, it expands the story in an awesome new direction while simultaneously tying it in with the base game. It adds in new gameplay, a few new mechanics, new weapons, new armor, new talismans, and of course, a new jaw-droppingly awesome and massive map. But more than all those other aspects, I'm just gonna keep it real here, man. Maybe I just feel this way because it's so new and I'm still in like that honeymoon phase with the DLC or whatever, but no joke, Shadow of the Erd Tree has some of the best boss battles I have ever seen in all of video games just across the board. Some of them, especially in the latter half, are just absolutely insane. I mean, without spoiling anything, I will say that there are two of them, one that includes snakes and one with bugs of sorts, and the moment I walked into the boss arena, I just had to pick my jaw up off the floor from how fucking badass and creative these boss designs were. But on top of all of that, man, the best thing about this expansion is it captures one of the most crucial aspects that I believe made base Elden Ring so damn perfect, and that's just that feeling of wonder, mystery, and adventure. Like for me in particular, my favorite sort of sequences in the main game were walking through and discovering everything in Stormvale Castle or the giant Rhea Lucaria Magic School. But let me tell ya, I gotta say, I think there are a few spots in Erdtree that, like I just said with the boss battle, straight up rival if not beat the locations from the base game. And that's just because, at least in my mind, it all kind of feels a lot denser here in the expansion. There is just so much new content to discover around every single corner or hiding away in some hard to reach nook or cranny. And for an expansion that the game director was saying would only be around the size of Limgrave if I'm not mistaken, dude, that was such a massive lie, but in the best way possible. Because seriously, Shadow of the Erd Tree is basically a whole new game. It really adds so much in every single aspect, the map, the gear, the story. It really is just basically Elden Ring 2, or Elden Ring 1.5 I guess is a better way to say it. And now, I will say, the only like perceptible downside to all of it is you can't just buy this DLC and buy the game and hop right into it. You really do have to work up to it. And yeah, it does kind of suck that it's locked behind beating a late game boss, but nonetheless, I think it's really important that it was done that way. And that's just because it actually gives something to the fans who have been playing the game since launch. You know, it's not so much an expansion as much as it is an extension, if that makes sense. And so look, just overall, if you're an Elden Ring fanboy, boy, oh boy, Shadow of the Erd Tree is a massive tree. And honestly, man, at least for me personally, I really do think it is the pinnacle of the entire Elden Ring experience. All things together, it is really just the best piece of DLC I've played in over a decade. And so that right there, that is why it earned its place at the number two spot on the list. But hey man, at this point in the video, we've gone over a lot of different games and a lot of different expansions out there, but of course, there's still one more we gotta touch on, one more piece of DLC that's gotta rule them all. And I mean, just a second ago, I was talking about how Shadow of the Erd Tree was the best expansion I've played in over a decade, and that was for a reason. Because for our final slot here, we got a bit of an older one to talk about, and it's one that has stuck with me for years upon years. So as our final DLC, at the number one spot, is the best expansion I have ever played in my entire life, we gotta talk about Undead Nightmare from Red Dead Redemption. And now listen, man, this was a really hard choice to make for the final slot, and I'll admit it, like a lot of the other pieces of DLC on this list, I'm sure there was a hefty amount of nostalgia that pushed me to make that decision. But look, I really don't care either way, because when it comes to DLC just across the board, even in 2024, this is what I always think about, and this is what I use as my bar for greatness. And that's just because Undead Nightmare does everything it takes to make not only an amazing piece of DLC, but just an awesome standalone gaming experience in general. I mean, for example, the story here, 
here while not tying into the main game at all other than just sharing the same characters. But even still, it's just one of those things where the narrative is just like so bad it's good. Not that the story sucks or anything like that, but it's just corny in a charming kind of way where it feels like those old school 80s zombies movies. Now, I don't know what the hell's gotten into you sick crazy bastards or what I've done to you, but I'm going to get help. Stay calm. As calm as you can, seeing as both of you seem to have gotten a little excited. Probably just a fever. Jack, be kind to your mother. Abigail, teach the boy right from wrong. Both of you, stop biting chunks out of people. Be back as soon as I can. But as well, and with the main storyline aside, one of the big things I really love about this DLC is the way they took the gameplay and the world that you've already been immersed into for hours at that point, and then they added their whole little spooky twist on top of it. I mean, from something as obvious as fighting and holding off waves of the undead from invading a town and using your handy dandy dead eye to pop off and land those headshots, or to something like the side missions that arguably provide some of the most memorable moments in the entire Red Dead franchise. I mean, for example, that side mission where you can find and hunt down the damn Sasquatch? That has got to be one of the most iconic video game side missions in all of history, even though it ends up being so extremely depressing and having you feel like a monster by the end. We've lived in these hills a thousand years. You eat babies. If you say so, humans. My family is gone. My kind. It's gone. Shoot me. I can't take it anymore. Make it stop! <laughs> Now listen man, on some level, if we're gonna compare this to the games of today's era, obviously it doesn't hold up as well as I'd like to admit. And if we're just gonna follow through with that logic and be really blunt about it, then Undead Nightmare probably doesn't deserve the number one spot at all. But if we can put that aside and just take a step back to try and look at this game in its time, you know, if you really stop to think about how much of a risk something like this could have been for such a massive studio, and for how easily it could have been screwed up, it just goes to show you the whole reason they made this to begin with was not to build their open world further. It wasn't to add some new deep threat to the storyline. No, instead, the only reason this was created was to make a fun as hell experience that any gamer out there can enjoy. To the point where you never even had to have bought the original game to enjoy the DLC at all. And that right there is a big reason as to why I believe this is the best expansion out there. I mean, with all the other ones we've talked about today, Blood Dragon aside, in some ways the rest of them really rely on the base games they're derived from. In many ways, they add on to or expand that core experience. But the thing is, without Cyberpunk 2077, there is no Phantom Liberty. Without the amazing story, storyline of base outer wilds, there is no impact of Echoes of the Eye. And even for Shadow of the Erd Tree being as amazing as it is, but no matter what, it's undeniable that a lot of that praise comes from it simply being more of an already perfect game. But with this DLC, with Undead Nightmare, it's truly an experience that can and does stand all on its own. And listen, just a few seconds ago I was saying that this is my bar for greatness when it comes to DLC, and of course that's for multiple reasons. You know, the pricing, the content, the story, the gameplay. But all that aside, the overall reason I truly believe that this is the best piece of DLC ever is because, you know, I don't think I've ever had a more memorable and fun experience with any other expansion like I did as a nine-year-old kid playing this game. And you know, in a lot of ways, Undead Nightmare upholds a lot of what I loved about all the other games that we've already talked about today. I mean, it was a risk, all for the sake of making something new and fun for their players, just like Far Cry Blood Dragon. It had a story that, while nowhere near the impact of something like Echoes of the Eye or Phantom Liberty, was still just as fun and oftentimes a hilarious adventure to go through. And especially if you play it today, just like with Bioshock's Burial at Sea or God of War Ragnarok's Valhalla expansion, it hits on some of the most amazing and nostalgic things that made OG Red Dead Redemption so fucking awesome. And so overall, man, Undead Nightmare, with its flaws and all, is truly just an embodiment of everything it takes to make an iconic and legendary piece of downloadable content. And that, my friends, that right there is why Red Dead Redemption's Undead Nightmare is the best piece of DLC in all of video game history.
Well, anyways, man, that's the video. You know, that's gonna do it. And now I gotta ask you, what do you think about the list? I mean, I'm sure this will be a divisive one. There's so many different games out there, and a lot of them have multiple different DLCs. But as well, and like I've been saying throughout the video, these expansions can come in so many different sizes, shapes, or forms. So I'm sure our opinions will vary quite a bit, but either way, I do want to hear your take on it all. I mean, would you have taken any of these expansions and moved them around to different slots on the list? Or instead, would you have just completely wiped the board clean and put a whole new set of DLCs up there? Either way, man, whatever your take is on all of it, I really do want to hear it from you, because at the end of the day, we're all just passionate gamers with different views and standpoints of our own. So be sure you drop a comment down below letting me know yours, and let's start a conversation about everything DLC. But anyways, man, now that we're here at the end, before you get out of here, let me just say for real, thank you so much for watching. You know, I know this is a little bit of a different video from what I normally do, but every now and then I kind of like to just sit back and talk over the games and the things that I personally enjoy the most, so I'm hoping you enjoyed it as much as I did. And listen, if you did like the video, be sure you represent that by dropping a like. It really means a lot when you do that. But as well, and if you want to see more stuff like this, be sure you check out the channel. I'm putting out new videos all the time, and if you do want to stick around, maybe even subscribe. It'd be pretty cool if you did. But um, yeah man, that's gonna do it for me. One more time, seriously, thank you so much for watching. I know this was a long one, so I'm hoping it wasn't too unbearable, but regardless, just thanks for watching, man. And um, yeah, peace dude. Have a good day.